Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of Darkly Deviant. I am your host Christian and today we're going to explore the queerness and horror of mermaids. Is this episode mildly inspired by the release of the new Little Mermaid movie and watching racists lose their minds over it? Yeah, it is. All right, where to begin? Many of us are familiar with the story that Disney adapted first in 1989 and then again in 2023. A headstrong mermaid princess who loves the land, falls in love with a human prince, sells her voice to the sea witch, and tries to win his heart before sunset on the third day. She changes back to a mermaid, and after an impressive fight where someone gets shish kebabbed, gets given human legs so she can be with her love, the human prince, forever. Legends of mermaids go as far back as the first century BCE, or at least those with a human fish, a human face and fish body. This written record by Diora, Diodorus Siculus describes a fertility goddess known as Atargatis or Derketo, with the face of a woman and otherwise the entire body of a fish. Ningyo of Japanese legend are more terrifying. Legend says that these creatures had a monkey's mouth with small teeth like fish, shining golden scales, and a quiet voice like a flute. One of the most prevailing myths of these creatures is that if one is to eat their flesh, they will become immortal. If you are a fisherman and caught a ningyo, you had to throw it back, otherwise there would be bad storms and misfortune. The master of eldritch horror, H.P. Lovecraft, wrote a novella called The Shadow Over Innsmouth, where at one point the narrator comes across beings with gills, webbed hands, and unblinking eyes. Eventually, the narrator himself acquires these features and debates suicide rather than living this way. Those of us who are in honor English or have been in some kind of literature class know of the sirens from the Odyssey, known to sing sailors to their deaths upon the sharp rocks. Odysseus lashes himself to the mast after instructing his crew to block their ears with wax or cotton while they sail past, and goes into an orgiastic frenzy trying to get to the sirens before someone knocks him out. Mermaids have been, in legends, both terrifying and romantic, horrible and gentle. But what makes mermaids queer allegory? Mermaids can show us a form of otherness, as many who we know as gay, lesbian, non-binary, trans, and other gender identities used the sea as an escape from normal society. As mermaids evolved from a heterosexual legend, they also gained a homosexual tub subtext. Men and mermaids could fall in love, sometimes with a happy ending, but most of the time ending in tragedy. Two stories have set the, qu the tone for the queer lens on mermaid lore and myth. The Fisherman and His Soul by Oscar Wilde and the or originator of the current mythos, The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. In our first story, a young fisherman catches a mermaid in his net, and after asking her to sing for him to make his nets fuller, he releases her. Every night he calls to her, and she comes up from the ocean to sing of wondrous and magical things, and in time the two fall in love. But because humans have souls, the fisherman and the mermaid can't be together, so he endeavors to find a way to forsake his soul, for he has no need of it. He goes to a priest who curses him, a merchant who offers to make him a slave, and finally to a witch who agrees to help him only if she dances with him. Well, to cut the story short, to cut the story short, the witch gives him this ability and he cuts loose his soul and sends it into the world. For three years, the soul begs him to let them be united again, but he says no. One time, he finally gives in and they reunite, only for the soul to cause the fisherman to enact wicked and evil things. Taking a vow of silence, he returns to the seashore and holds up there for several more years, looking for his love but never finding her. Then one day her body washes up on the shore. Heartbroken, the fisherman drowns himself with his soul reuniting with his heart at the last moment. 
The subtext here is practically highlighting itself when you realize who wrote the story. It was written in response to the Anderson version, which we'll go over in a moment. The fisherman and the mermaid can't have reproductive sex as ordained by the church, much like gay men couldn't. The priest and the soul play into each other as the church and society, capital letters. The priest curses the fisherman for even thinking about abandoning his soul, a.k.a. heteronormativity, while the soul tempts the fisherman to abandon his feelings for a reason, get married, have kids, make money. The story has its own horror elements, where the fisherman goes to meet the witch at a black mass overseen by the devil. I won't get into the symbolism here, but it reads like a copy-paste from Cotton Mather. In the end, while the fisherman and the mermaid don't live, the priest discovers beautiful flowers that inspired him to preach about love and acceptance, and they came from the grave of the two in a pauper's field. Realizing his wrongdoing and cursing the fisherman, he goes forth and blesses the sea and in turn all of God's living things. If that's not societal acceptance of homosexuality, I don't know what is. I imagine I speak for many of us when I say that Wilde had lots of hope for others like him in the future. Finally, we get into Anderson's tale. I won't go super into the story because many of us are familiar with its premise. Instead, I'll list the difference. When the sea witch gives the mermaid her legs, she tells her that she, when she walks upon them, the pain will be like walking on broken glass or sharp knives. The prince ends up marrying someone else. And of course, finally, in the end, the mermaid kills him herself by drowning herself overboard. However, instead of dying, she becomes a daughter of air and, become, and can gain a soul after 3,000 years of good deeds. Ricker Norton, a queer historian, was one of the first to theorize that this story was written in Anderson's response to the engagement of Edvard Collin, who he was potentially in love with, with Anderson even sending the story to Collin. With this theory in mind, the story is seen as an allegory for Anderson's life and never be able to be with the one he loves, and in turn having to do penance so God would forgive him for his immoral love of another man. Wow. Wow. That's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? Mermaids as an allegory to queerness is something that I hope will continue to be explored. There are a few movies that popped up in my research that I might explore later. But for now, I hope this episode has whet <laughs> your appetite for what I have in store. Thanks for listening. Stay deviant, stay dark, and remember to keep the light on.